Isheri Alofi is a populated place. The estimated terrain elevation above sea level is 37 meters. The Ogun River is a major source of income for many people here in Isheri Alofi. However, fishermen here have had their fortune reversed by the menacing plant in recent times. This is not the first time, but we have never had it this bad. It's used to trickle in so that we will all contribute to evacuate it into the sea so that we can do our job. A team of scientists from the University of Lagos conducted a research to assess the water and sediment of Ogun River at Kara Abeto in 2014. According to them, the level of pollution in the river is disturbing. Chemical parameters that we looked at. Dr. Rose Alani is one of the three scientists who conducted the research. It's not that it's just uh, <laughs> overnight. The, it's the availability of nutrients, the condition for it to grow very well, and the turbidity. Actually, um, the, you know, constant disturbance of that water is also bringing, you know, the, some sediment on the suspended solids up. And then those suspended solids, you know, they are carrying the nutrients. And the nutrients, apart from what is coming from under, is still also still flowing in. And so the wheat, you know, they could be released and they can, you know, the, the seeds can be moved by air, by wind. And so when they land, they find very fertile place to grow. And then, so they, and then you have some solid also that are suspended and that are brought up. And so they stay there. And then as they stay there, the other ones are also settling, you know, coming up and then seeking. And then as the growth goes, it, it can grow in a short, a short while. The place is already very fertile and you know, nourishing for them to <laughs> grow. So when it starts, you might not see, but it will just bloom, it will, you know, and just cover the place. But water is still there under, definitely. And, also, you know, people have to be careful. Water is still definitely there. <laughs> now, scientists believe these plants may also have some good uses. The hyacinths have been found to have the capacity to reduce emission of greenhouse gases. Many other seaweeds can do the same. Increased carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, mostly due to fossil fuel combustion, is driving rapid climate change. As the atmospheric carbon dioxide goes up, so too does the carbon dioxide in the oceans. We know that we need to stop burning fossil fuels fast. But we also need to remove some of the carbon dioxide that is already in the air and oceans. And that is where seaweed comes in. Like other plants, as seaweed grows, it absorbs carbon dioxide. But what makes seaweed a particularly appealing carbon sink is its growth rate, about 30 to 60 times the rate of land-based plants. This rapid turnover rate makes it ideal for mass-scale production. On top of this, some species of seaweed are super stable and don't break down easily, meaning they have high potential for long-term carbon storage. Plus, seaweed can also be harvested and used to produce biofuels reducing our needs for fossil fuels. Using less fossil fuel is crucial in the battle against climate change, but businesses don't have much of an incentive to make changes unless low carbon technology is cost effective. That is where carbon pricing comes in. It works by factoring the environmental harm done by fossil fuels into the cost of producing or consuming them. If carbon-based energy is more expensive, it is believed that this will discourage people from using it. At the same time, renewable energy and investing in the technology to generate it becomes more attractive. But this will only work, experts say, if the price of carbon is right. If it is too low, it won't discourage businesses to use less energy or switch to renewables. If it's too high, some economies may not be able to absorb the cost. You will see people had all sorts of uh, cooking 
oil and things like that that are not contributing to the you know uh, 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 destruction of the ozone layer you know people talked about designs of houses that you know conserve energy and things like that. so there are different kinds of systems there are solar systems that people talk about there are different kinds of systems that we need to bring to the fore and educate people on uh, for some of them they may not be cost effective now but as time goes on cost will go down as uptake increases cost will go down you know and they become things that the ordinary person can 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 actually access so who's going but we to need start? to start who is going to start well you know i mean there are people already starting that's why we are bringing them bringing them together there are institutions that are starting there are individuals that are starting you know we should not be left behind you know it may not be something that can be massively uh, taking not all the technologies can have massive uptake at the moment but there are some technologies that are appropriate that are cheap enough for people to, to use at the moment. An emission trade system, sometimes referred to as a cap and trade system, caps the total level of greenhouse gas emissions and allows those industries with low emissions to sell their extra allowances to larger emitters by creating supply and demand for emissions allowances an ETS establishes a market price for greenhouse gas emissions. The cap helps ensure that the required emission reductions will take place to keep the emitters in aggregate within their pre-allocated carbon budget. Seaweeds are one of the most important living resources of the ocean. In spite of their wide applications in food and feed industries, they have gained importance as medicinal sources because of their high healing, antimicrobial and antioxidant properties. And with the pulp you can do so many things. The pulp we are produced with paper, you can get your cellulose from the pulp, the cellulose. You can get your glucose, buy it and all, from the cellulosic fibers. Like I told you, the, the, the cellulose uh, polymer of glucose, the fermentable sugars, it can really be hydrolyzed to produce bioids and also there are a whole lot that one can really turn this waste into. At the end of the day, you'll be able to achieve a situation of from waste to wealth creation. Researchers have estimated that if 9% of the world's ocean surface were used for seaweed farming, we will be removing 53 billion tons of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, and that's just from the absorption of carbon during the growing process. If that seaweed was then harvested and processed, it could also produce enough biofuels to replace all of today's fossil fuel energy needs. The nutrients left over from this process could then be recycled to assist with further seaweed farming. And it doesn't stop there. Seaweed farming can also produce safe sites for breeding fish populations as well as reversing ocean acidification. The technology that is needed to achieve this level of global seaweed farming is already available and in use, however, at much smaller scales. Seaweed farming is well established in Asia and China is leading the way with hundreds of square kilometers of seaweed farms off its coast. The technology is slowly expanding into other regions. If seaweed can remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and also reduce fossil fuel dependency by providing a sustainable source of biofuels, more researchers are hoping to see more of it in the future. That's our program for the week. Thank you for watching. You can send your comments or questions by writing to sfile at channelstv.com. You can also view this episode or any other episode of the program by visiting our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash channelsweb. Click on the playlist menu and then click SFAL. From me, Ayola Kasim, and the rest of the SFAL crew here in Lagos, it's bye for now.